a deserted plain in the middle of Egypt, hundreds of miles from the famous sites of Cairo and Luxor. There are no tourists here, and yet below the ground lie the ruins of a great lost city. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence of open-air temples and works of art unlike any in ancient Egypt. There are remote tombs with puzzling images, echoes of a revolutionary cult that changed the course of history. This desolate landscape was once the capital of the mighty Egyptian empire. What happened here? And why has so little survived? This is the story of one of the most traumatic episodes in ancient Egyptian history. Under these sands lie the ruins of an extraordinary social and religious experiment that rocked ancient Egypt to its foundations. For some people of the time, it was a vision heralding heaven on earth. For others, it was their worst nightmare. Either way, this vision continued to haunt the human mind right into our own day. The mysterious ruins were first discovered last century in Amarna in Middle Egypt, far from Cairo in the north and Luxor in the south. The first strange clues to this lost city were found in tombs hewn into the surrounding cliffs. The walls of this one are covered with unusual reliefs. This relief here shows a king and his wife. We know it's a royal couple because of the clothes they're wearing, but we can't tell who they are. Their faces have been chiselled out. Even their names were hacked out. But a clue to their identity lay in the sagging belly of the pharaoh and in the image of the sun bathing the royal couple in sunlight. They had a familiar look. Very similar images appear on the throne of the most famous pharaoh of all. Tutankhamun. It dawned on explorers that Tutankhamun and the faceless pharaoh were closely related. Some even suggested they were father and son. The mystery king and queen were only identified after undamaged reliefs were found in the Amarna ruins. He was Akhenaten, an enigmatic pharaoh held by some as a visionary, branded by others as a heretic and a criminal. She was Nefertiti, one of the most beautiful women of the ancient world, and also one of the most powerful. Nefertiti, even while she's queen, is shown doing things in ways that other queens never are. She wears pharaoh's crowns, which other uh, queens do not, even while she's still queen. She is shown in one case smiting her enemies, just like a pharaoh does. No other queen is shown this way. Akhenaten and Nefertiti were husband and wife, and they had ruled Egypt in the middle of the 14th century BC, just 20 years before Tutankhamun. And yet, for all their importance, they might as well never have lived. This is the temple of Seti I at Abydos, 60 miles north of Luxor. It has a list of the kings of ancient Egypt. But the list is incomplete. There's no mention of Akhenaten or Nefertiti. 
This is the name of Akhenaten's immediate predecessor on the throne, one Amenhotep III. Akhenaten's own name should be next, here, but it isn't. There was an active campaign to basically erase Akhenaten's reign from ancient Egyptian history. And whenever it was necessary to refer to this period or to Akhenaten himself, he was only referred to as the heretic. What did Akhenaten do that was so awful? Akhenaten and Nefertiti first made a name for themselves in Thebes, the capital of Egypt during the 14th century BC. The conquest of foreign lands from Sudan in the south to present-day Syria in the north had brought untold power and riches to the Egyptian empire. Thebes, modern Luxor, was its capital, and Karnak its main temple. Larger than the Vatican, Karnak is more than 3,000 years old. Egypt's religion was polytheism, belief in many gods. The king with his priests prayed to the gods on behalf of his people. But the chief god of Thebes was Amun, symbolized by his two-feathered crown a god of fertility and creation. The high point of the Amun cult was the procession along the river Nile of floating shrines with statues of the gods. But all that came to an abrupt end when Akhenaten became king around 1353 BC. In a baffling move, he abandoned Amun in favor of a different god. the Aten, or Sun Disk. The Sun God was as old as ancient Egypt. He was already worshipped by the first dynasties a thousand years earlier, during the time of the pyramids. Akhenaten's decision must have come as a shock to the influential army of priests who administered the rituals to Amun here at Thebes. The priests were used to pharaohs piously bending the knee before Amun as the chief god of this place. Not only was Akhenaten refusing to do that, he was actually promoting another god to rival status. What possessed the king to scorn the god of Thebes? There's evidence that his father, the previous king, Amenhotep III, was already leaning towards sun worship. These are colossal statues of Amenhotep III himself. They were built during his lifetime out of a very special material. The stone for these statues, called quartzite, was no ordinary stone, and Amenhotep III had to fetch it at huge expense from quarries many miles from here. What made it so special was its golden glowing colour. It was associated by the ancient Egyptians with the sun god. The statues were also positioned to catch the first gleam of light from the rising sun. Such overt homage to the sun god was unusual at the time. But that's as far as Amenhotep III dared go. His son Akhenaten, however, had no such qualms. He believed the sun deserved to become a fully blown cult. Five years into his reign, Akhenaten unleashed another shockwave. Thebes, he announced, was too closely linked to our moon and so unsuitable for the Aten. The sun disk needed its own holy city. The capital of the Egyptian Empire had to be abandoned. To the consternation of the priests, Akhenaten and a small band of loyal nobles left Thebes in search of a new capital. After scouring the length of the Nile, he came upon a site in the middle of Egypt. It was exactly halfway between Thebes and Memphis, about 170 miles as the crow flies. 
the shore where Akhenaten landed is in a region now called Amarna. The villagers live in the fertile stretch of land on the east bank of the Nile. Beyond it lies a forbidding plain surrounded by cliffs. No one would dream of running the Egyptian Empire from such a bleak and remote spot. Yet it was here that Akhenaten decided to build his new capital. He must have realised the move would shock Egyptians because he justified his decision in writing. His reasons can still be read today in an unexpected place atop one of the surrounding cliffs. A symbol of the Artem has been carved into the rock as a boundary marker. Below it is a text. It says that His Majesty found here the place of origin of the Artem, after arriving mounted on a great chariot of gold and silver. But why did Akhenaten think this was the birthplace of the Artem? He and his supporters first came here with only tents for accommodation. This truly was virgin land and so had no links to any other gods but the king found something even more convincing. In Egyptian belief, the horizon where the sun rose was called the Archet. It was symbolized by the sun disk rising between two mountain peaks. The hills that surround the Amarna plain are suddenly interrupted by a break in the cliffs. It was a sight to behold, especially at dawn. he must have thought he'd found the sacred birthplace of the sun god. He named his city Archet Aten, Horizon of the Sun Disk. The site has lain buried for 3,000 years, but this century excavators have unearthed the remains of over a hundred buildings. What's really exciting is that there's enough evidence here to recreate virtually the entire city. The excavations give an idea about the foundations and plans. The relief scenes show you the elevations, and then all kinds of decorated fragments give clues to the final appearance. In the heart of the city stood the temple to the Artem. Right next to it, the king's house, Throne room. The finished interiors were in stark contrast to the barrack like exteriors. But this was a city built in a hurry. There was still scaffolding around when the royal family moved in. It's rare to find remains of ancient Egyptian dwellings. These ruins offer a glimpse into how a middle-class family lived. This is the house of a sculptor called Tutmosi. And what's amazing is that you can still see the basic layout. And you really get a feel too for how large this house was. I've just come in through the front entrance and now I'm in the principal living room. Another exciting thing are these stairs because they tell us that there was once an upper story. Now here over this wall, you can see the grain silos. But this is my favorite bit. It's the master bedroom with ensuite bathroom. Architaten was long ago abandoned, but there's still life in the area. Several villages nestle between the ancient ruins and the Nile. Ways, life has changed little since pharaonic times. 
The present people are a mix of the old indigenous population, along with Arab tribes who moved into the area in the Middle Ages. There are glimpses of daily life in ancient times on fragments of reliefs from Akhenaten's temples. People were paid in bread and beer. A heavy loaf and a strong brew were just reward for a good day's work. Wine was another favorite. The vintage and the chateau were carefully recorded on the wine jar. The River Nile has always been the lifeblood of Egypt. It still is. But it can be painfully slow and tiring to fetch water from the river. The renegade pharaoh had a better idea. This ring in the sands is an old well, one of many found in private homes. They provided clean drinking water and they allowed bricks of dry mud to be made on the spot. They were handy too for watering the garden. No self-respecting resident could afford to be without one. But Akhenaten didn't come to this forsaken place to win a town planning award. He came with a utopian dream, perhaps to create a perfect society. This is the workshop of the sculptor Tutmosi, and in fact it was sculptors and artists who spearheaded the realisation of this dream. Indeed it was here, in that very corner, where archaeologists early this century made a wonderful find that sums up the achievement of Akhenaten's artists. A bust of Nefertiti had lain under the rubble for more than 3,000 years. The work of art is unlike any in ancient Egypt and underlines the importance Akhenaten attached to perfection. No one knows why one eye is missing, but most experts now think it fell out in antiquity. Maybe it's still out there, waiting to be discovered. Akhenaten's pursuit of perfection was single-minded. Buildings, too, had a role to play. These are the remains of a palace. When it was first excavated, the walls in this room were found covered with fragments of a mural, which has now been reconstructed. The room opened onto a secluded garden court. But the best preserved examples of Akhenaten's homage to the Aten are to be found inside the nobles' tombs. This one was never finished, but it shows how the stonemasons carved the columns straight out of the rock. It was built by a military officer called Ai during his lifetime for himself and his wife. It's thought that Ai was Nefertiti's father. But the highlight of the tomb is in fact a religious text carved on one of the walls. It's a hymn by Akhenaten, dedicated to the sun god Aten. What's so remarkable is its similarity to a psalm in one of the world's most sacred books, the Bible. O oh, living sun disk, thou art beautiful, great, glittering. When thy movements fade, the land is in darkness. Every lion is out of his den. O oh Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Thou makest darkness, and it is night. The young lions roar after their prey. strikes you when you read those texts very much like a, a religious revelation, a flash of insight that uh, a, a prophet might receive um, from his God. But the hymn to the Aten is yet more surprising. 
it anticipates the central belief of the Bible. O sole God, with no other except him, thou createst the earth according to thy heart, while thou art one. This was the first ever recorded expression of monotheism, the belief that there is only one true God. Because of his monotheism, Akhenaten comes across as a religious visionary ahead of his time, a forerunner of the great prophets of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And yet, Akhenaten's revolution had barely begun. His goal was to reform ritual as well as belief. The Aten was worshipped right here in this temple. As in other cults, ordinary people were kept out of the temple. Only Akhenaten and his priests could enter the inner sanctuary. But Akhenaten came up with a new idea for including the people in the worship of the Aten. An aerial view of the Amarna region shows that the king had boundary stones marking out precise city limits. There were also definite axes pointing east and north. Architect Michael Mallinson analysed a recent survey of Amarna by the Egypt Exploration Society. He noticed that the boundary stones and the temples formed a series of perfect rectangles. What did it all mean? There was a clue in the geometry of the temple itself. Its proportions, when projected out, were the same as those of the city limits. It's as if the whole city had been turned into a temple. Everyone can see the horizon of the Aten, where the god first appears, and it can be worshipped as such. He's opening it all out, so suddenly it's all apparent, it's all visible. So it's gone from being a religion which is closed to a religion which is open, and that's completely consistent with the way he himself represents his religion. It doesn't seem, though, as if ordinary Egyptians took advantage of Akhenaten's offer. Excavations at a worker's village suggest a reluctance to give up the old and familiar ways. There was still a certain amount of um, worship of traditional gods, um, or there were certainly chapels, and there is evidence for various fertility gods and things associated with the ordinary people, which may suggest that they weren't that interested in Artanism. But Akhenaten soon began to court greater controversy by changing the standing of the king himself. The ancient Egyptians saw their kings as a vital link between the gods and humankind. It seems that Akhenaten was aspiring to a much more exalted status. This is one of the most frequent reliefs found at Akhetaten. It shows the royal couple at a balcony handing out gifts to members of the nobility. Thanks to copies made when they were in better condition, such scenes can now be recreated. This one is known by Egyptologists as a window of appearance. It shows Nefertiti's father, I, being rewarded for his loyal support. It looks like any secular palace ceremony, but new finds suggest that this ritual had heavy religious overtones. Recently, a team from the Egypt Exploration Society, run in the field by Kate Spence, found some intriguing foundations in an area of the city known as the North Palace. Among the finds were the bases of large-scale statues. They hinted at a major complex. Just how important a complex became clear while filming, when tiny fragments of a precious metal were found. 
<laughs> what have you got there? There you are, a nice big bit of gold leaf coming out in front of your very eyes. It was the first trace of gold found at the North Palace since the 1920s. So that's a sign of something pretty special? Very special. It was associated with the sun and with the flesh of the gods and the fact that it shines, that when light falls on it, it reflects off it, was very important to the Egyptians. The golden statues could only be of Akhenaten. Kate Spence also found that they had stood next to the base of another mysterious structure. Okay. She's now this covered it with sand to protect it from the elements. Um, there were two huge, great big stone jams, which the foundations of which the gypsum underneath them was preserved. One in here and one in here, with a wall running along in between them. The whole structure bore the hallmarks of one of the balconies where nobles collected their gifts. So what were the religious overtones of this ceremony? A vital clue lay in the strange orientation of the palace. It was aligned to the east. Usually only temples pointed east. Perhaps the palace was intended to be like a temple. But who then was the object of worship? one enters the building, one is approaching directly towards the king, who is therefore set up in a similar sort of way to a cult image in a temple, and where he appears um, as a divine or semi-divine figure. This was hardly the style of a humble prophet, more like the delusions of a megalomaniac. What exactly was going through Akhenaten's mind? An insight into his thinking can be gleaned from his tomb. Like all pharaohs, Akhenaten built his tomb while he was still alive. The nobles' tombs in the Amarna Plain were cut into the surrounding cliffs. But not Akhenaten's. He built his four miles further east, deep into a valley that winds its way through the desert. It's always been a mystery why the royal tomb is so remote. When it was first discovered earlier this century, it was virtually empty. But there was one bit of treasure which couldn't be removed, the reliefs, and they reveal much about Akhenaten's religious ideas. This damaged relief shows the king and queen carved in an unflattering style, with sagging stomachs and ample thighs. It's a far cry from the idealised picture of royalty usually seen on tomb paintings. In these and other reliefs, the king and queen are also shown revealingly naked, in defiance of the normal conventions of Egyptian art. Imagine, for example, if a future king and queen of England had themselves portrayed nude, it would be quite a shock. And I think it probably, this was probably the same sort of thing for the, for the Egyptians. There is a reason why Akhenaten is shown this way. Uh, Akhenaten was trying to show the royal family as different from the rest of mankind, uh, closer to the gods. And there was another telling difference. Egyptian tomb paintings, like this one in Thebes, usually show highly formal scenes of the pharaoh about to enter the afterlife, his destiny very much in the hands of the gods. Akhenaten's reliefs depict surprisingly intimate and informal scenes in which members of the royal family itself, and not the gods, are the centre of attention. In this scene, the king and queen are shown mourning the death of a daughter. Here, Akhenaten is seen dining with his mother. And here, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are seen exchanging affectionate glances. I think the purpose was to convey to the ancient Egyptians that here you have not only the model 
of human life, but also the source of all love. And so the idea, of course, is that all life flows from Akhenaten and Nefertiti, just as it originally did from the gods. No pharaoh had ever associated himself with a god as closely as Akhenaten had. And yet there are signs that he was aiming higher still. Akhenaten's ultimate ambition is revealed in a radically new view of the afterlife. Traditionally, the spirit of the dead was believed to set in the west with the dying sun. It then journeyed into the netherworld of the night, where it would meet Osiris, the god of resurrection, and receive the power of rebirth. In the morning, as the sun rose in the east, so too the spirit would rise from, from the door of its tomb and come out to live among the living. This was the ancient Egyptian idea of paradise. Akhenaten, it seems, was quite prepared to undermine this cherished belief. The key to his view lies in the puzzling location of the royal tomb. The recent survey of the region reveals that it lies on the same axis as the temple to the Aten. Indeed, the valley that leads to the tomb is the very break in the cliffs which to Akhenaten looks so much like the sacred Archet, or horizon of the sun disk. The Achet in ancient Egyptian belief was a place in which the sun spent uh, perhaps as much as an hour before rising in the morning. Now this was not just a zone of transition between the nether world and the world of the day. It was a place also where the sun received the final effective form that it needed to come to life again in the morning. The royal tomb was situated in the very birthplace of the Aten. Why? There's a clue in a major relief in the royal tomb. It shows the Aten rising in the Archet. Its rays radiate out, breathing life into every street and house in the city. The final piece in the jigsaw emerged from a survey of the royal tomb's relation to all the other boundary markers. Suddenly, the royal tomb's position seemed to make sense. The magical birthplace of the sun god appeared to be none other than the royal tomb itself. The message was loud and clear. Akhenaten's soul would rise as one with the Aten, bypassing the journey to the underworld to meet Osiris, the god of resurrection. It was a heretical thought, but also a frightening one. The common people, laborers working on this tomb, would have been very worried about what's going to happen to them in the next world. Where now is their guarantee of rebirth if Osiris is in fact non-existent, if there is no Osiris? Later dynasties branded Akhenaten as a criminal as well as a heretic. Why? Well, there are signs that his final goal was to lay waste to virtually the whole 2,000 years of Egyptian religion. The first casualty was the Opet festival in Thebes and its pageant of statues of gods paraded from temple to temple along the Nile. Akhenaten stopped the ritual when he moved to Middle Egypt. It must have incensed the people and left a void in their lives. But perhaps even more offensive is what Akhenaten decided to put in its place. Another frequent relief found in the city is of the royal family driving chariots. These drives were no Sunday afternoon jaunts in the country, but stately parades from temple to temple along the royal road. Instead of having processions of divine images, you're having processions of the king himself. 
that's a fairly meaningful act to swap the, the procession of the god for yourself in a chariot. There's no record of what people thought of their king's behaviour, at least not officially. This figurine of a chariot was found in the Amarna ruins. It's driven not by the king, but by a monkey. These are the only hints of descent dug up by archaeologists, surprising perhaps in view of the scale of Akhenaten's reforms. But a close look at the chariot scenes reveals why. Armed troops escort every chariot procession, ready to squash any signs of protest. But even this show of force only hinted at the magnitude of Akhenaten's designs on Egyptian religion. After about 10 years in power, he issued the most brutal edict of his reign, the desecration of all the old gods of Egypt. Akhenaten attacked every shrine in the land. Back in Thebes, the god Amun bore the brunt of this backlash. Akhenaten seems to have been very thorough in his efforts to erase all traces of the rival god Amun from the temples here at Thebes. It wasn't just the colossal statues of the god that he desecrated. Even in a small relief scene like this, the face of our moon has been hacked out. Inscriptions on the top of obelisks were full of references to our moon. They were barely visible from the ground, but they had to go. A climate of fear now pervaded the land. This amulet was found in the ruins of a house in Amarna. It had our moon written on it. Its owner felt it was perhaps wiser to censor the word. There is, in the history of the world, a number of movements, communism, Nazism. I think they all, in the beginning, uh, infect people uh, with a new way of looking at things and bring people along with them. But it seems to be common human nature that eventually what is a liberating theology becomes restrictive. You can no longer accept alternative ideas. You must only accept one idea. And at this point, fanaticism starts. And what's interesting about Amarna is you can see it's starting happening in human history for the first time. This was the nightmare which later dynasties branded a heresy and a crime. This was the trauma they wiped from their history. How it came to an end, and who erased the memory, is shrouded in mystery. But here and there, one can still hear the faint echoes of a violent aftermath. In his late 30s, and after 17 years of absolute rule, Akhenaten disappears from the record. No one knows what happened. The royal tomb was found empty. Some believe he was a victim of a plague then raging. Others claim he died a natural death. A new theory suggests he may have been the victim of a conspiracy. The murder of a king was quite common in antiquity. In Egypt's case, the facts are sparse. But Nicholas Reeves, an expert on the 18th dynasty, believes the possibility cannot be altogether ruled out. In the Middle Kingdom, the 12th dynasty, Amenemhet I was murdered. We have this, uh, we know this from a document, uh, a literary text. And we know also of a harem conspiracy against King Ramesses III of the 20th dynasty. Such things were, I suspect, not uncommon. No one knows whether there was a traitor within Akhenaten's court. Those he would gain were his successors, but there is even doubt over who precisely succeeded him to the throne of Egypt. One candidate is an obscure pharaoh by the name of Smenkare. Some argue that he was a younger brother or son of Akhenaten. But others claim that he never existed and that Smenkare was a pseudonym for someone else. It's only recently that we've begun to realize that in fact Nefertiti played a, 
quite a powerful political role. Akhenaten appointed Nefertiti as his co-regent to rule beside him um, partway through the reign. And the likelihood is that following Akhenaten's death, she continued um, to rule in her own right, adopting a new name, Smenkare. Whoever succeeded Akhenaten had a short-lived reign, dying soon after being crowned. What is known is the identity of the next pharaoh, a boy of nine who ruled Egypt for a decade. Tutankhamun's parents are a mystery. Many think he was Akhenaten's only son, born to him by a lesser wife. His present-day fame stems from the wonderful treasures discovered just over 75 years ago. It's thought that Tutankhamun died too young to play a major part in history. But the boy king, in fact, presided over one of the most critical periods in his country's history. As king, he faced an agonizing decision to champion his father's ideals or to steer Egypt back to normality. Which side of the fence did he come down on? The known facts are that the return to the old religion began during Tutankhamun's reign. This is the boy king's throne. It has a cartouche with his original name, Tut Ankh Aten, living image of the sun disk. But the other side of the chair shows that he later changed his name to living image of our moon, Tutankhamun. And yet, the restoration was not carried out by Tutankhamun himself. He was too young. The affairs of state were in the hands of a close relative, the father of Nefertiti, the officer I. It was he, a former ally of Akhenaten, who in fact renewed the cult of Amun. He was due to hand over power when Tutankhamun came of age. Instead, the boy king met a premature death, and I himself acceded to the throne of Egypt. Tutankhamun died young, probably aged no more than 18. The cause of his death is a mystery, but there's no shortage of foul play theories. One of the most sinister points the finger at his close relative, I, who effectively ruled Egypt while Tutankhamun was a child. What's interesting is that when Tutankhamun is of an age to entertain his own ideas as to how things should be, this is precisely the time when he disappears. These ideas may well not have fitted in with the way forward that I envisaged. Could it be that Tutankhamun was in fact very much a chip off the old block and the early death of the boy king saved Egypt from another round of heretical fantasy and destruction? Tutankhamun's death proved a watershed. Pharaoh after Pharaoh set about obliterating the memory of Akhenaten and his heresy. The whole city of Akhetaten was dismantled, block by block, leaving only the mud brick inner walls. The suppression far exceeded Akhenaten's own persecutions. Ancient Egyptians must have thought they'd heard the last of Akhenaten. But in 1907, excavators stumbled upon a strange royal tomb, not in Amarna, but in Luxor, in the Valley of the Kings. It was found strewn with broken furniture. Tomb 55, as it is known, dated from Tutankhamun's reign, so it must have housed a family relation. But who? The coffin was moved to Cairo Museum, but it was impossible to tell who it belonged to. The mask had been torn off. Even the name had been chiselled out. There were no clues to its identity, except inside. The skull and bones of an adult male. When we first examined 
Was the body related to Tutankhamun? DNA tests on the fragile tissues are not yet allowed. But Dr. Nazri Iskander was one of a team of forensic experts who compared an X-ray of Tutankhamun's skull, shown here on the left, with an X-ray of the mystery skull, shown here on the right. Now, this one is very close to this one. And according to the, some dimensions we are measuring and some angles of the mandle and some parts of, of, the, of this skull, we have found that this is the first degree relationship. It means it is father, son, brother, or something like that. This is the first degree. Early experts thought the bones looked like those of a young man and argued that the body was therefore Smenkare, the presumed younger brother or son of Akhenaten. Of course, if Smenkare was in fact Nefertiti, this would be impossible. But a recent re-inspection of the age of the teeth has led many to reject the Smenkare idea. The teeth could suit an age of death between 35 and 40. My own view is that the body from 255, so far as one can judge from the archaeological evidence, is the body of Akhenaten himself. Why Akhenaten's body should later turn up at Thebes is a bit of a mystery. But I think what seems to have happened was that when the Amarna capital was abandoned, Tutankhamun took it upon himself to transfer the bodies back to Thebes. Akhenaten died around 1336 BC. Tomb 55 was found 200 years later during the digging of another tomb. If it was Akhenaten's, perhaps the site of the heretic caused revulsion and the coffin's desecration. Only then was Akhenaten truly forgotten. But his ideas didn't die. They lay dormant. The vision of one true God resurfaced a few centuries later in the revelations of a Hebrew named Moses who led his people out of Egypt to the Promised Land. The God of Moses has been the bedrock of Jewish, Christian and Muslim faith ever since. Akhenaten's own religious experiment may have crumbled to dust, but the dream of a holy city fit for the one true God never faded. It continued to haunt the mind of visionaries and fanatics through the ages, right down to our present day. <laughs>